because I had nothing else at the time. I didn't have like right. girlfriend or any other thing sure. to keep me where I was I at. Know. Just this job. Yeah. And it was a new job. Went to my boss, my boss at the time, super fucking cool, former musician, well, current musician, but former gigging so musician. So he gets it. He was like, dude, you got to go, man. Yeah. And I was like, really? And he's like, dude, you got to go. I was like, he's it's like, like the Henry Rollins story. Totally. <laughs> and he's like, don't sweat it. You know, when you get back, we'll find something for you. You know, you'll have yeah. somewhere to work. And I was like, that's fucking awesome. Call Ross back. Let's do it. He was fucking shocked. He's like, dude, we called everybody. We called Tim Young. We called all these guys that were yeah. that were filling in drummers at the time. Because I don't know if you remember, but... <laughs> All right, here we are back with another sub CLE. It's been a while. I've been trying to do some upgrades around here, um, but I'm really excited about this one. Uh, I've known him for quite some time, um, back when I was a young lad, and uh, he's moved on to bigger and better things. Um, Steve Shalati of the band Immolation. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Dude, um, I'm really excited about this just good because, uh, yeah, it's good to see you. Thanks, I think you were one of the first people I think I met getting into the music scene in Cleveland. Um, Likewise. Yeah. Uh, flashes. I had a uh, geo on here and no uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was actually the last one wow. before I took the break. Yeah. Yo. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and doing the musicians nights up there, you know, yeah. Um, but well, let, let's go back. We'll get into all that. I just yeah. want to know. I just want to know um, when you uh, when you when you got into music. Like what what was the catalyst that started? Like you know, going down the you know, obviously it's heavy metal. You know, or was it just music in general? Like what got you into playing drums? Uh, playing drums was a total kind of an accident. It was like a plan B for me. Um, I don't know why, but I just always thought or felt like i was into music even when i was so young that all i was listening to was like whatever mom and dad were listening to and like pop stuff whatever was on the radio so when it was available in school i think it was like fifth grade i started playing saxophone and it was cool but not as cool as i was hoping because <laughs> my i think my goal always in the back of my head was to be able to play to the music that i like and like to listen to yeah and i you know thought you know it's some cool sax stuff and uh i had a uncle that played sax and he used to belt it out so you said music that you what you were into what, what were you listening like chicago and stuff or was just what sax was or whatever on the radio oh, okay. back in the uh early 80s mid 80s yeah. um you know as terrible as that was but i think it's saxophone and i think of that uh george michael wham song or whatever that is like dee, 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 dee. <laughs> no like i was i like dudes that were belting it like like kenny g and stuff i know okay it's terrible but oh. um you know when when i was really into the saxophone it was stuff like that that i was yeah. listening to um i went to see him live once too uh, <laughs> with a buddy of mine that played sax but it didn't last long my um orthodontist at the time who i'm pretty sure it was a quack was like yeah. told my parents that the way that i played the sax and the mouthpiece was like affecting my overbite and i had braces at the time and he was like we're fighting and yeah. whatever probably nonsense but um so they asked me if there was maybe something else i wanted to play and if you think about the horns and all that stuff that's just like smashing mouthpieces into your yeah. braces you know so i was like drums drums you know everything i like has drums in it you know yeah I mean? that's a pretty cool instrument so drums it was so i made smooth transition into drums already had my rhythmic training from the saxophone you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i was able to pick it up and and get into it nice and quick um but just like any instrument you know it's super boring at first you're not playing <laughs> anything cool right you know you're definitely not learning how to play a drum set which is where right. it's at when you're talking about modern music or what was modern mm -hmm. music at the time and where i wanted to get to you know so there was a lot of playing on the pad you know what i mean right. for a long time but eventually uh i got into it e but even before that i was trying to figure it out 
and I would sit there with my snare drum and literally turn on the radio, a little clock radio or whatever, and tick, tick, cock, tick, 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 cock. You know, not even yeah. using my foot, but just playing along right. with my favorite songs, you know, because everything's got a little snare in it. You know <laughs> right. I mean? yeah, it's, uh, yeah. You know, I, I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play to the music, you know. I to well, you know, that's interesting because, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people, and myself included, uh, started just playing, you know, songs that we really enjoyed and kind of cut the whole... Uh, learning process out of it and i think i i think i when when i first met you actually uh i definitely heard the fact that you were a little bit more trained than the the normal local musician you yeah know what I mean? yeah. So, yeah i stayed in drums in school until i graduated yeah yeah so um I uh, so I was in concert band and all that stuff all through school yeah. on the drums. I was super competitive about it. Um, and once you get into high school, they like encourage that competitiveness, especially if yeah. you're in like marching band or whatever. And uh, yeah, I was just like, I just thrived in that environment. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I loved what drums were all about. And I don't know, I just felt connected and like like it was part of what defined me even from a young age it yeah. was just like this is what i want you know what i mean right i love doing this i love doing this so you came at it with with a love for music first of all it not necessarily like a genre or a style or anything like that no uh yeah initially and and i was uh as much of a jazz drummer as i was a rock drummer right you know, in my formative years uh before I got introduced to, to metal, like metal sent me off on this other <laughs> tangent. And uh, it was my cousin. I don't remember how old I was. Man, I had to be like 10 or 11. And I was at my cousin's house and my older cousin had like Kiss posters and all kinds of crazy yeah. metal posters. And I was like, I just remember seeing Kiss and be like, wow. Dude. <laughs> That's usually what the one. It was that, you know? They, like, they hit it. No idea. I'd never even heard a no to Kiss. Yeah. It was just being a... Uh, they just look cool. I was like, it looked cool, but it looked like yeah. super intimidating. And yeah. I don't know, something about it was like, yeah. But even at a young age, I was the type of kid that was like always rooting for the bad guy. I loved Darth Vader. I loved, yeah. You know what I mean? I was yeah, like, yeah. get him. But yeah. uh, so I was just like fascinated by that. And then eventually one day we were in his room or whatever, me and my younger cousin, and he came up and he, so he played Kiss for me. And I was just, ask Kiss? What? It doesn't match. And then- <laughs> But that same day, he also played me Def Leppard, yeah, high and dry. I think at the time, and I was like, "That is, yeah, what? that is sick." I never heard anything like that, yeah. and uh, I was like totally into it. And that kind of just sent me on the road. Like right. next thing you know, I got Pyromania, and then just started listening to more and more of that. And I started to seek it out when I was when I was able yeah. to. You know what I mean? You go to the mall and it just. Yeah, it's snowball. Yeah, well, I mean, that sounds very similar to me. I had a friend, and he introduced me to, like, you know, Shout at the Devil and, you know, Kiss. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking the same thing about Kiss, because I remember seeing pictures of them when I was way younger. And I was like, oh, they look cool. They look like comic book guys or something, you know. Fire and vomiting blood, you know what I mean? I was like, this, this has got to be yeah. the craziest music. But I remember hearing them and saying the same thing. It was yeah. like, wait, this this, is, this isn't the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so the same buddy, though, uh, I, re I remember specifically it was uh, Pyromania, uh, Def Leppard. Dude, what a rockin' album. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so, okay, so, all right. You're you're doing the that, and then you meet some guys and start playing in a band or what? I mean, what what? How does that progress? How does that? How did you? Because you know you're playing in like a death death metal band, right? Mm -hmm. Could we say Immolation is death metal? Yes. Um, there's so many subgenres. Um, but how did you make that switch from you know? Because obviously Def Leppard's. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, in junior high and whatnot, when I started playing the drum set because my parents were cool enough to get me into some lessons for a little while and i was taking lessons from this guy he was super old big band drummer like buddy rich style drummer you know what i mean and uh like knew all those guys from those bands and stuff and, really? and played with these big band orchestras you know what i mean nice he just it was incredible i didn't even realize how incredible it was at the time to <laughs> right to be you know with this guy as much as i was so I took lessons from him. So he got me on the drum set early because they didn't teach a drum set in school. 
And then because I was... It, they didn't have a jazz band in school? Eventually, but at that oh. point, there was nothing. You were oh, okay. just learning your basics, your concert sure. uh, band stuff. So that by the time it did get into junior high, where you get into jazz band, I was ready to go, you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I got into that, loved that. I did every band I could. I did pep band. Um, I did uh, marching band, concert band, all that stuff, jazz band. And um, what school was this? John R. Okay. John R. into Riverside. Okay. Dover High School. Paysville. Okay. Good old Paysville. Yeah. We were the Beavers, dude. <laughs> that was our mascot all the way from seventh to twelfth grade, both schools. Yes. Yeah. Whatever. But um yeah. And I was like going crazy for the drum set. So I was playing at home. I was playing in every drum set band I could at at school. I had the drum set set up in one of the practice spots, like the practice rooms for the band department, and I would get permission from the instructor to go up there and practice like during study hall, you know, yeah. If yeah. I didn't have anything to do, I'd go up there and and play to Metallica and stuff like that, yeah. you know, because the skater guys on the bus got me into Metallica and Megadeth and Anthrax. Okay, yeah, and like punk stuff like Dead Kennedys. That's so weird. No, I just have to interrupt you, it's just because, you know, it was on the school bus that I got into Metallica, Master of Puppets, right. and stuff like that. You know, Crazy. it was like the older cool kids in the back of the bus, yep. you know, bringing their boom box you know i call it back yup they had thrasher magazine it was just like i started looking through that and i was like dude what is this yeah. what is this what is this and then they would bring me the tape and i'm like oh my yeah. god and then the next thing you knew i'm playing drums the whole way to school and the whole way back yeah, music's a lot it's very drum oriented too you know dude, yeah so awesome yeah i would play like the double bass parts with my toes i didn't know i didn't have double pedal yet so yeah. i didn't even know how to do it but it would like make the splashy sound if it was wet and stuff so that, 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 that clicky <laughs> drove people crazy but yeah i became obsessed with that stuff you know what I mean? yeah and, uh, so then you know that bridged me into thrash and thrash was all about speed so i'm playing jazz which is can which the type of jazz that i like playing at the time was crazy fast yeah playing this thrash metal which was crazy fast and uh yeah it just had me on this trajectory you know what i mean yeah i remember the first time i, I saw you, you um play was uh at that touch of athens across from deaconess the practice rooms that used to be over there yep yeah and uh you were doing some buddy rich jazz stuff you know and then all of a sudden it just transitioned into just a blast yeah. <laughs> i was like i was like that is the coolest thing ever man yeah yeah that's <laughs> that was my plan for it like um you know i at a certain point i had to decide what i was going to do because I, I definitely wanted to play but do i want to play and like go to college for music yeah or i'm already in this outfit that's doing crazy shit and new bands i'm being introduced to new bands all the time that are doing even more crazy shit than yeah. the bands I heard, you know, right. at that point in time when I was getting ready to graduate high school it was the early nineties. And, you know, there was a, a million thrash bands coming out and the death metal was already starting. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was just like, I would find new stuff and, and more amazing shit, you know, all the time. Um, but I was undecided me and Scotty and Justin were working at a, uh, well, we, we skipped that part. How'd you meet those guys? Oh, those guys were my, my dudes <laughs> from school. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I've known Justin since fifth fucking grade. We, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we both got transferred from our home elementary schools to this other school nearby called Haddon Elementary that had this new program called Kapow, Kids Are People of Wisdom, and it was for like... <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, uh, they called them gifted students at the time. You know oh, that's I mean? cool. And it was basically because, at least in my case, like, I was fucking up at my home elementary school and they yeah. wanted to know why. So they started doing these tests on me at weird shit like that. And before you know it, they're like, we're sending you this new program. Say goodbye to your oh, friends. that's cool. I was like, it wasn't cool at the time. It sucked. Well, but it, it they, they <laughs> I think, it, it, I think it was cool be, that they realized that okay, it's it's not because you have a learning disability, right? Or something, yeah. you know, yeah. they, there's so, it's something special, about totally. you, you know, which was cool because yeah. I was going to a, a super countryfied little tiny elementary yeah. school, so I was lucky in that respect. But anyway, I met Justin there, so I'd known him for a long time, 
And then um, in high school, uh, I started going out with this girl who was like a year ahead of me. I think I was in 10th grade. Got to high school. I'm in 10th. But this girl, she was a junior. Started going steady or whatever. Yeah. Just so happened, though, that this was Scott's older brother's who was a year ahead of me. So he was, or no, he was a senior that year. No, he was a senior. So he was two years ahead of me. This is his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and back in the day, that, you know, dude, not, nowadays it's like, ah, hey, whatever. But yeah, back then. Cool. <laughs> so I remember our, I had homeroom in the band room that year. And I remember Scott coming in there and coming up to me and was like, fuck fucking i'm gonna kick your fucking ass <laughs> how dare you fucking you know he was my brother's girlfriend or my brother's girl or whatever and i was like oh, oh shit like he was fired up you know what i mean like right i didn't do a good job of describing it but he was pissed i knew it was on you know what i mean right and i knew he would have thrashed me because he even back then he was big did you know beforehand I knew that he was a psycho. <laughs> no, no, but did you know beforehand that that was his brother's oh, ex-girlfriend? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not not trying to step on anybody's toes. You know? Right, yeah. Um, But I, I knew, I didn't know Scott, know Scott, but I had seen him. And like he, he sat, obviously sat across the room from me in homeroom and shit. Yeah. And I'd just seen him do crazy wild shit. And he already had the long hair and was totally rebellious. You know right. what I mean? And I was like, oh, fuck, this kid's going to beat my ass. <laughs> so you know but i had to diffuse the situation i instantly put my arm around him and i was like listen dude listen 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 and i just started talking to him you yeah. know what i mean and he cooled down because you know neither one of us really wanted to go right. to the principal's office or anything like that either so he cooled down and then like after that we became really good friends cool. he's the one that started pushing me into the dark corners of like death metal and oh, stuff okay. like that because i was already into thrash you know what i mean so right. So we started getting along and then the three of us, Justin, you know, was already friends with him and like, we were like the, a couple of the very few death metal or like thrash metal, like heavy metal guys in high school, you know what yeah. I mean? We, it was just our, around town too. Group. Like all, you know, cause I, I think you guys were, you guys were at an elite level, I think, you know, no, seriously, real at a young age that was the idea that was the point man. yeah yeah but um by that po up until that point i had been going through like all the musicians in my high school so i played with this dude that was like glam rock and we had like a little i don't know like power ballad glammy band for a right. minute there you know what i mean but like i moved on from that and i obviously had to thrash and there was only a couple dudes that played or were interested in even trying to play in my high school I jammed with all them and i was like this is going nowhere yeah. So then I started going and talking to dudes from Mentor because I would meet dudes at shows and stuff like sure. that. And those guys went through all of them. There was a couple of good dudes, but you know yeah. nobody who was like throwing down. And so I talked to, oh, I put an ad in the paper and in the Cleveland scene. Okay. And I fucking got it, an answer or or was it that I answered an ad? Maybe I answered an ad. Two guitar players looking for a bassist and a drummer. Okay. So I went to Scott and I was like, dude, let's check this out. You know what I mean? I got this ad here that they want a bass player. You you know, you're the only dude I know that plays bass. Would you be down? You want to go check this out? You want to yeah. go with me? You know, let's let's check it out. Yeah, okay, let's do it. So we drove all the way out to Cleveland. We met Scott Hilberg and his other buddy at the time whose name escapes me um but scott was pretty fucking down you know what i mean we liked him he was funny and we got along with him right away and the other dude was a little man he was a little more uh yingve you know what i mean than right. what we were trying to do but we played we learned a couple of their songs and uh um we were like we need a singer so scott was like i'll do it and scott started singing and he was doing like sepultura type barking you know what i mean yeah, yeah. and it was like whoa i That's knew that awesome. that wasn't what those guys wanted those guys right. were looking for like a power <laughs> uh power metal type thing yeah um and i was like wow it's awesome and immediately he's just started steering the music 
heavier. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like immediately the stuff we started writing with them was getting heavier and that other guitar player was getting flakier by the day and he had a real domineering girlfriend at the time and it was mm -hmm. like started to become a problem. So this whole time we're best friends with, with Justin. Yeah. For some reason, and I never understood it, Scott just didn't want to bring him into the fold. Hmm. I don't know what it was. Yeah. I don't know if there was a competition there because they were both playing guitar on the side. I don't know what it was, dude. It was weird. Right. We all got along great. Sure. So when that dude failed, I talked to him into it. I was like, bring Justin in, bring Justin in. You know, for on, man. It's a three. It makes sense. And yeah. You know? So we brought Justin in. Bam. Perfect. Everything was good. And we started writing, started pushing. Got rid of the other guy. The other player. guy was history. Yeah. Yeah. Scott was singing, playing bass. Justin on guitar. Scott Hilbert on guitar, man, drums. Nice. It was good to go. We started writing, getting better at writing, getting better at playing, woodshedding. We got the spot, you know, under, under oh, yeah. Mr. E's or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And uh, traveling out there, you know, because those guys were still in school. Did you have a name at that time? Zymergy. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zymergy. I remember being in study hall with Scott and being like, all right, dude, these are the names I'm down to. I had like three <laughs> candidates and I was like, what do you think? Yeah. Zymergy, whatever. Sounded, I don't know. I original at the time. That, but yeah, yeah. It's it's like the scientific process of, of uh, rotting like oh okay putrefication sure makes sense whatever <laughs> yeah so that was the working name and um we started doing the musicians nights you know what I mean? yeah to get to play we started doing stuff around in painesville here in the yeah. area and uh that's kind of how we broke broke into that you know playing live and for us like we were practice hogs, like we practice all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. Good time. We'd spend the night at the practice spot and just like play all weekend. Yeah. And we were listening to s death metal that was like more technical and tight at the time and like faster, pushing the envelope shit. You know what I mean? Death, kind of. Death, yeah, sure, sure. But like malevolent creation, suffocation, sure. Zor guts, stuff that was like, yeah. you know, more double bassy and blasty and. Yeah less dark and stuff so um yeah and uh because of that work ethic i think we just were like we're able to keep advancing keep advancing keep advancing yeah. and uh made a name for ourselves geo showed us the way there you know he taught us a lot of uh important lessons you had changed your name by this point though no um no yes so when we started gigging out, we changed it to gutted. Yeah. Right. That's what I remember. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like when we, before we played our first, well, we played at one show as Zymergy. It was like a death, Cleveland death metal fest. And like every fucking band from around here in Michigan and wherever played on that fest yeah. back in the day and didn't go over very good for us. <laughs> no. First, first time playing and yeah, yeah. It was just, I don't know nerves or something or it was a very nervy performance yeah. like all our peers were there it was a full house we weren't getting the response from the crowd they were very judgy but everybody was back then you sure know what i mean so um but and we were fine-tuned we were very thrashy still and you yeah. know we were just like getting into it getting into it but it was important to go show our shit and run right. and see what what you what it took what do you need to do absolutely you know, to, to yeah. run with the big boys or whatever so but after that it was just all and, all, and we started to get a following from the musicians nights you know yeah. what i mean that's what really built us man that built so many bands back then and yeah we would go that's a big deal it, it, that's talked about quite a bit on uh, yeah. there with a lot, a lot of people everybody's there every yeah. time yeah yeah so even if you don't get to play you're there everybody else is there you get right. to see everybody else playing yeah you know it was like yeah. then we would start doing shows like we saw hemdale yeah, yeah. play a musician's night and we we're like holy <laughs> fuck where the fuck are you guys from <laughs> oh we're from metter oh fuck you're right next door to us what the fuck are you kidding me what are you guys you guys are freaks man <laughs> like how did this happen and then we would start doing shows out there you know what i mean we yeah. had a show with them in painesville at the fucking music store and shit where yeah. they used to take lessons it was crazy 
So Hemdale Musicians Night. So so where did where did you go from there? Um, you mean as far as us and Hemdale, or as or far as as far as just uh, what what happened? Like how? Because obviously you became odious sanction at some point, right? Okay, yes. What led into that? Uh, well, at the time when we started playing at Flashes. Those dudes, Scott and Justin, were still in high school, man. So, like, I was oh, really, yeah, yeah, because they were a year behind me. Oh wow! And Scott well, actually, was, I was still in high Scott yeah. was like bad in high school and <laughs> junior <laughs> high, and he got in trouble. You know what I mean? So yeah. he was having a real hard time. I think he might even been two years behind or whatever. Justin graduated early, I think, like a half year early or whatever. It's like totally opposite. Yeah, and <laughs> came and joined me which is what I was waiting for, we moved out to Cleveland. Okay. So we moved onto Pearl Road above Nunzio's. Okay. Took the shit out of the dungeon, and then we had in our family room above Nunzio's. So every day after whatever the hell time it was, I think five or six, yeah. Nunzio and the boys would go home, and we could do all the, make all the racket we wanted because there was nobody else living around it. Right. So... uh those guys came out and um scott was still staying at home he still had like another half a year or whatever but he was buckling down he's trying to get out of there because we had been we played our first national opener yeah with um disincarnate okay james murphy and those dudes were like you guys need to come out with us on tour yeah, like yeah. now and i'm like those guys are in high school so you yeah. can't <laughs> and so like everybody felt the pressure you know like scott was like dude Scott did a total 180, man. He was totally rebellious and violent and fucking up and turned it all around. It was like, I got to get out of high school. Oh, okay. It was awesome. And uh, graduated early or whatever. But uh, at the same time, we were gutted. There was See, a gutted down south. To it. Totally. <laughs> there was a gutted down south or from Toledo or something. I yeah. forget where they were from. But we knew of them and we were like, man... And, uh, you know, the unspoken rule at the time was whoever gets signed first gets to keep the name. Right. Because, uh, you know, we'd all been mailing the name around so that there wasn't yeah. any claim there. And they got signed to some small label. So, you know, rules are the rules. And, uh, you know, we felt really bad because we had done a lot of work to try to establish that name at that point. And that's really a, was a big part of the game back then. Right. So we did... I, a big show, probably our biggest show ever at Flashes as like the name change show. Okay. We did the flyer for it. We did everything. Gut it is now, blah. Kind of, let's get this. Yeah. Get let's going. get together on yeah. this. And it was fucking awesome show. Nice. I think we had demos at that show, you know what I mean, with the new name on it and shit. And yeah. so like, yeah, it, that, that was great. Good move, good transition, didn't suffer too badly because of it, and we just left Gutter behind and um, kept pushing on with it. Uh, and But like I said, we had started to develop relationships with the other bands that were doing the musicians' nights and stuff like that. So we were having, we were doing shows with them in other places, small clubs, mm -hmm. Decrepit, Hemdale, Escalation Anger. Now we're setting up our own shows at different clubs. You know what I mean? And now we've got this this Cleveland coalition of sure. bands, and we could bring them out further east by us or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. We would call each other, you know? Oh, yeah. Decrepit's playing at this bar or whatever. You guys want to play? Fuck right. yeah, let's do it. Let's combine forces. Right. You know, let's bring fucking people in. Let's fill the rooms. And it was working great, and everybody was doing really good, man. It was a good yeah. time. I remember that. Heck yeah. And it was just, you know, for us, it was up and up. And um, so, yeah, I had to make that decision, though, at one point, like, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to school or am I going to pursue this, you know? And one album came out that changed my mind, Gore Guts, Erosion of Sanity, 1993, the year after I graduated. Like I said, I was working in a, in a shit job with the other two boys, and that came out, and the drumming on that was, like, yeah. next level, yeah. like, Okay, cool. Because I had a the problem I had was with the just barbarity of death metal drumming for right. the most part. You know, cannibal chords, like you know, and it was yeah. just a lot of duka duka duka. You know, I mean, there's a lot of that. And yeah. coming from a a 
kind of a classically trained background you know what i mean a little bit of rhythm i wanted <laughs> i wanted to see some artistry you know what i yeah, mean like yeah. show me some actual technique and stuff like that you know what i mean and when i heard that i was like it can be done it can be done this dude did it this is fucking beautiful yeah. i love fell in love with the album thought it was a masterpiece and the drumming just totally turned me on so yeah that made the decision for me but we didn't have like super high hopes it's not like we were chasing the pot of gold or anything you know what i'm saying we were just doing it because we realized yo you practice five times a week and really put it in you know what i mean we can this lineup that we have can fucking do it you know what i mean so we just kept yeah i mean it's not like you're ever going to be a taylor swift you know because dude money never money never even came into the picture dude like you weren't making money back then it was just like wow this fucking show was like twice as big as the last fucking show. Right. Fucking doing something right. Wow, we're fucking out of demos. Wow, you know what I mean? Yeah, people yeah. start coming up to you. People start talking to you. Now they're playing on the college radio stations. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You, you like you're making friends. You're networking. You're fucking. You know, it was it was just a good positive thing that we were doing, and we were loving it. We were loving what we were doing. So so so. What? How long were you doing the odious sanction? And- Odious Sanction, I think we put the final kibosh on that in like 2005. Okay, so th- so that was quite some time. Straight out of high school. Run. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, how many releases did you put out? Uh, um, th- two demos, an EP, and two full links. Okay, that's quite a bit. Yeah, both the full links were... Um, signed and put out by a uh, unique leader okay out of california so i mean you know because i just remember you know i was like i'm listening to national acts i'm like okay i know these guys own his sanction i'm like listening to you guys and it's like well this is way better you know and and the vocals are extremely pissed like you know you compared, <laughs> it, you compared it to uh <laughs> yes. you compared it to uh max cavalera but in you the know, beginning yeah, yeah i i was i was definitely influenced by sepultura um but and i thought i kind of brought it but i think those vocals are it, it's like it's like another level of just piss scott went through stages dude we we all did we all you know we were all just learning and yeah. figuring out what we wanted to do and yeah he, yeah he developed that when we first started playing he was doing all like when we we're doing like we put the demo out if you listen to the demo that's almost 90 percent just low gutturals he was right. doing with super lows he was a huge chris Marnes fan right and that was what he was doing but you know bands like um malevolent creation especially was one of our favorites you know what i mean and, and shit like that dsi you know he started to do more of the forceful screams and he was just well he he was pissed he was a pissed kid he's <laughs> his own he's his own person though, yeah yeah i think they like you you name all these other people but it's that like, kind of stuff not, that kind of stuff green lit it for him that's right brett hoffman doing those fucking crazy alien screams right and die motherfucker and all that shit that he did on retribution was like that opened the fucking door for for scott to do that shit and it's like a banshee yeah dude it's kind of like you know just like but he went through stages you know like he started like i said doing the barky stuff then he went to straight lows then we started to really uh admire vocalists that had some sort of range so you could change it up and it wasn't just like burp 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 Burp, 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 burp. you know what i mean so then he was like really <laughs> experimenting with range and doing yeah. mids and lows and highs and whatever the fuck you know what i mean and yeah. he's just got such a sense for the music that he was able to just do exactly what was needed in every spot it was just like it was great it was part of the dynamics man so what the hell happened man because i i thought that was i, I was like dude they're gonna be one of the greatest yeah. metal bands oh dude <laughs> thank what you what happened Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so we signed a unique leader. Holy fucking shit. We're signed. The fucking album's out. They remastered it, redid the artwork to distribute it big time. And it wasn't long before they shot us a, a tour offer 
they're like, we want you to go out with incantation. Nice. And we were like, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, no. That's Why not? not? That's just not a good match for us. No, okay. You know, they were like very, at that point in time, they were super dirgy. Oh, okay. really fucking do me, you know? And we we're like, mm. we had, we'd known them for a long time. They'd played a lot in Cleveland and shit. Um, we we're like, that's not right for us. Okay. Um, so then they offered us, the next thing they offered us was like a blood, one of the first bloodletting tours. So it was like all unique leader bands and including, no, I don't think they were on it. Um, Deeds of Flesh is what I'm referring to. Okay. So Eric from Deeds of Flesh and Jacoby, they ran that label. Okay. So when I say unique leader, I'm talking about those guys. Okay. But anyway, um, so they put this tour together and we were like, oh, fuck. It was a bunch of, of a couple new signings to Unique and some, some, some heavy bands, good stuff. And we were super stoked about it. But we're being realistic about it. And what we were going to probably make as far as money on it. And we were like, we're going to owe money at the end of this. Okay. So we figured out conservatively how much, if we did owe money, how much it was going to cost each one of us to make this tour happen. Right. Because that's your 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 virgin tour. That's your first tour. It takes money to make money. Right? It's super important to do that tour, though. Yeah. Like, if you want to get to the next level, you got to do that tour, and you got to have a fucking smile on your face, and you got to do a great job. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's super important. So we're like, fuck it. What's it going to take? You know? So we figured out it was going to take, like, 1500 bucks from each of us. Oh, that's a good amount of money back then. Yeah. To make this happen. Yeah. Or to cover ourselves so that we were, like, in the hole when we got out of it. You know, we had this, we're just going to put this money aside for it so that we can do it right and then like pretty much right away gene was like i'm not gonna be able to raise that money i'm just not gonna be able you know because this tour was scheduled already yeah and we we're like well like i said at 20 30 20 years ago maybe is that what they, i don't know yeah a lot of dating <laughs> no, 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 no. that was a lot of money yeah it was like 99 now it's like yeah. hey we probably get that together <laughs> right but so he told us that and we were like fuck so i was like i don't care i talked to the other guys and we're like okay um we're gonna do it each one of us will raise an extra 500 okay to cover his shit <laughs> his 1500 yes so we did now by this time what i didn't mention was that we i mean a lot went on but we lost uh, Justin, and we got Kevin, Kevin Farley, from Joe Petrich's outfit, oh, Happy yeah. Rainbow Death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were in school with my sister. Okay. And I knew them. They were a little younger. Yeah. They knew Odious. We knew them. Yeah, I had Jimmy on here. Yeah. Uh, and Kevin is, oh, yeah. I, you know, I can't say enough about Kevin's musicianship. So we were like, dude can do it for sure. So he was down, did a great job. So he was with us. But when we got signed, yeah, Justin missed it by like fucking six months or a year, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so yeah, we were all going to pay for it. And then like it was coming time to do it. And Gene was like, I can't do it. I can't go. I can't because he had bought the club. And he's been trying to find a way to get out of it the whole time. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But he had he had Pitt Cleveland going. You remember Pitt? Yeah, yeah, I said. He had okay. just bought that, and he was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to leave. No. Yeah. And we're like, dude, dude what? No. Yeah. What do you mean, man? And by that time, we didn't have any time to find someone to fill in. There was no one that could, like, really do it. I think we talked to Aaron Dallison. Yeah. He came out, played with us. He's yeah, like, on. yeah, he was like, <laughs> dude. Love that dude. Um, and he was like, nah, I don't know, guys. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think we might have even had Jimmy out. Um, Fami. Oh, nice. I think. Yeah. Not sure, but I think we did. And it just wasn't, you know, wasn't there. He was like having a real hard time with it. Like he oh, yeah. definitely had the chops, but he was like really having a hard time with the groove. And he told us, he was just like, dude, I, I don't know. I just can't catch that groove. Oh, really? What's going on there? And I'm like, Fuck. 
We got nobody. There's no. Yeah. This is fucking Cleveland, Ohio. You know, it's not California. <laughs> California that and those at that time was full of fucking dudes that could have probably yeah. done it or whatever. But we didn't have the resources, so we had to back out of the tour and then fucking. Oh, really? It was brutal. Yeah. So I have to do this just because it's because yeah. of you, Jimmy. Finally, uh, <laughs> Jimmy, why? <laughs> but uh. <laughs> yeah so we're he's a good friend of mine oh of course yeah <laughs> so we're super bummed and a lot of resentment probably because so of that did the band no it didn't it oh. didn't we kept going um kept playing we were playing at the pit we decided well gene kind of decided or persuaded us to consider going to the pit to play from now on i got the stage we can play on stage That'll be our home stage. We'll be so comfortable on that fucking stage when we play a live show. It's going to be right. like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. But driving out to fucking Cleveland every time to practice, because like I said, we were on like five day a week practice, you know what I mean? At that right. point in time, got old fast and it got fucking just, it was tough. So people could make it. Practices got canceled yeah. down to what, three days a week maybe. And when you're playing Odia Sanction at only three days a week. Yeah. When you come to practice and try to play that shit, fuck, shit hurts. It's hard. Yeah. People nice. start, guys start getting frustrated. Yeah. There's a fight. You're going too fast. You're going too slow. This kind of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not going to get any better until you get back that schedule or whatever. Right. And uh, yeah, it stopped being fun for everybody. It started to become, you know, a pain in the ass. And uh, I think at that, right about that point in time, Kevin had a daughter with the girl he was with and yeah it all came to a head at one show where uh i was sound checking and gene was trying to get the sound mixed or whatever it was at the pit and him and i got into a, like a shouting match over over sound check and like that was it we scott and i had a talk about it and uh we decided it was best if we part of ways with gene and tried to continue okay yeah and then during that three-way phone call gene was like throwing a fit arguing his case and scotty and our oh really yeah, scotty yeah. and i are soft-hearted and we're loyal and you know we love our friends and shit and yeah. a lot of history with that dude at that point and you know we're definitely bros you know? right so we're like, oh, all right, dude, but you know, this and this has got to stop and we got to start doing this. There we got to make improvements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it wasn't only that. There was like a lot of opportunities we lost out on because of his temper yeah. and shit. Like, you know, there was more than a few shows where we had to stop him from destroying the promoter or whoever. The, I, you know what I mean? Just to interject here, it, yeah. it just the, uh, I've noticed, you know, playing with, various people around town and stuff like that you know it's like or just knowing people not even necessarily in my own you know whatever uh it there's some people that are self-defeatist as soon as they see any amount of uh success they have to just blow it up that for <laughs> some reason yeah and i don't i don't i never understood it <laughs> yeah but it, it happens a lot this is true, and I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's accurately describes Gene. I okay. think Gene was just hot. Gene oh, was super okay. hot, <laughs> with super bad temper, and uh, very proud. So these are not bad things to me. I, yeah. I, I yeah. like Gene a lot. You know, yeah. I mean, we all did. Like I said, we we're we we're brothers, man. We lived together and 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 you know, sacrificed together and stuff. No. Yeah. But he would, you know, he would get into some sort of altercation because at the time he was doing all the booking and, and pretty much the management for the band. We were all working, hence we were saving the money for the tour while he was <laughs> not. He was right. doing the band stuff, but that was his gig, and that's right. why we were all like, right. whatever, we'll raise your money. It takes a village. Right, but also <laughs> he was just not the best PR guy, you know? He was <laughs> super, super intimidating, and like I said, man, we, we had... We had burnt bridges with a lot of major venues at that point yeah. and we were relying on ourselves to to do gigs because because now of that still friends with him now gene passed away like okay I'm four sorry. years ago i think okay because but no we were not okay you were yeah we were, yeah yeah we we split after that when i yeah. never talked to him again 
Okay, because uh, because I was just about to say, I'm like, we're talking a lot of shit about this dude. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 and, and I'm yeah, not. No. I mean, so I, I was bro, like, after this, you probably won't be. <laughs> I'm really not. I'm really not talking shit on him. Like, no, I, I it's totally. The facts are the facts. I have I, exactly, and every anybody yeah. in the new gene knew what I'm saying about him is true, and he yeah, was, yeah. you know, that he just had that personality, man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it was what it was, but it that was pretty much what put put a, a fucking crippling blow to the band. Uh, and a few years, a couple of years went by and Scott and I were just like, what the fuck are we doing? Man? We got to fucking, you and I started this. Yeah. Let's fucking do this, man. Sure. We'll fucking call Kevin, get him over, you know, start writing some fucking tunes. You know, I still got it in me. You still got it in you. Let's fucking do it. And so we did and we started writing crazy songs and Kevin came over and he was like, that's too crazy. You know, it's just a lot of fucking work, guys. What are you trying to do? You know, like I said, by by this point, he's got a daughter that's so many years old now and stuff. Well, and this goes back to what I was saying. Even at an early age, you guys are at an elite level. So it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to. You know, yeah, find we set the bar high. Yeah. And we knew that at, if we were going to make a comeback, that we had to outdo our whatever magnum opus, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, that we yeah. did at, at our, our peak. But like the shit we were writing was fucking good, and I was happy with it, and it was extreme, and it was pissed, and I and it was Scott was playing and singing, but it was you know the riffs were there, the vocals were there, and shit, and uh, like I said, Kevin was just like that's eh, a little much, and so <laughs> <laughs> we found uh, practice more. Yeah, yeah, Scott found another dude. <laughs> no, it was just a matter of having time. It, it, yeah, like I know, at, I at that it. point, we had learned the lesson of if everybody's not having fun, it's not going to happen. Right, exactly. Everybody's got to be enjoying it to be willing to sacrifice their time and whatever energy. So we found, uh, Scott found this uh, other cat, um, Adam Schwan, and uh, he was super enthusiastic about it, was a fan of the band beforehand, super metalhead, nice nice kid. And he joined, and Scott pretty much trained him to play and to sing. And so he brought a friend in, to sing for a while dude failed out within like two years as soon as we tried to do a, a recording with that guy we did a few shows nobody said anything they just you know went, oh, we missed scott but you know they didn't say like yeah this guy's a lemon and then we tried to go record we tried to record with him with jimmy oh nice yeah at that point in time i was playing with those dudes There's a lot going on here but yeah, yeah. At, at that point in time i was playing with those dudes well, this was let, let, about 2004 we, three or we four. could bring up the red eye rock club right Totally red eye, dude. Yeah, <laughs> that's saw emulation there. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. Yeah, I used to see those guys at local shows, and you know when they come through Cleveland. Or <laughs> that whatever. was in North Royalton. Yeah, yeah, and I would go and be like, "Great job, guys!" You know, what I mean? yeah, like, yeah, it was just crazy. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, we were trying to record a demo, and he went. It was time for him to do the vocals, and we were like, "Oh my god, no way!" This is this is what you got, dude. No. So why wasn't Scott doing vocals? We wanted Scott to play just guitar. He didn't want to have to concentrate on both, and we wanted a front. I know, but we wanted a front man. We wanted we knew the value because Scott played bass and sang for a while, and yeah. then when Justin things happened, things changed. When Gene joined the band, Justin moved over. We got rid of Hilberg at one point. You know, we we missed a, a few moves yeah. around and stuff we left cleveland moved back out to the country right. a lot of things happened in there but um at one point scott was like i just want to sing and we were like fuck yeah dude sing it up bro because <laughs> in the studio he was an animal when he yeah. didn't have that bass on him and he was recording his vocals we were like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're like cool yeah whatever justin was like i'll play bass cool we got now we got one guitar player justin's on bass scott's singing only and that's when we took off, dude. Scott as a front man, gold. Yeah. That was what he was meant to do, man. Yeah. And so so we wanted to preserve that dynamic of having an actual front man at the time. So we, that's why we got this dude. But it quickly became apparent to us he wasn't cutting the mustard, especially if you're going to try to outdo what we did already Absolutely. with Gene and them guys. So um, then it was back to Scott singing and Adam singing. So we were a three-piece with those two guys singing. We played a couple shows. It was like, like a carcass kind of. Yeah, it was it was good. It was pissed, but it just wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't catching like it was before. You know what I mean? Right. And um, 
but we we plugged along for like three years i think like that and uh at one point we had to cut adam loose he was uh he was a little out of control with the drinking and uh we got um justin back in for a minute <laughs> for a minute good old justin. yeah and we played like two shows <laughs> and we played like two shows and then justin's uh Justin's sensibilities won out on me, and, and the two of them were like, yeah, I don't this no more, dude. Like, we had made it to a certain level at one point. Right. And for us to go back to now we're playing opening slots at the Fantasy again and shit, right. you know what I mean? They were just like, psst, don't want to do it. Huh. So that was it. That was 05, I think. That's surprising to me, you know, because, you know, I, I just, like I said, the odious sanction thing, I just thought that shit was just such a high level, like, uh... We're roughly in like 2001 area, so we've split with Gene at this point. Uh, Scott and I are doing our own thing with Adam. Yeah. But it's up and running. We recorded a demo with with Jimmy and Tony and the boys. Yeah. I was playing with them at the time. Um, what was that? That was Mechanicore. Okay. Um, what was Tony doing? Tony was just helping us record. Okay. Yeah. It was kind of part of the deal at the time. Okay. So, so anyway. Uh, and Johnny Lick was in that? Lick, Lick was not in it. Okay. But he was always there. Okay. Yeah. He was like entourage. <laughs> but, uh, you know, love Lick. So, yeah, yeah. Always. We had such good times back then. But anyway, so like 2001, uh, I just started working at, at a motorcycle dealership. My first time ever. I just recently got into riding and stuff and i was super obsessed with it almost like i was about drumming and martial arts and stuff it was like one of my big three at the time so okay. uh my girlfriend at the time was the one that taught me how to ride their bikes and she talked me into trying to get this job you know i was always a kitchen guy up to that point she's like well, right. can, you know go there's a new dealership open go up there you know we got to lose they hired me they didn't want to but they eventually did and I'd been working there about a year, maybe six months even. And I got a fucking call from Ross Dolan of Immolation. <laughs> he had called somehow. Oh, yeah. He got my father's, so my parents' house. What? Phone number from the guys at Unique Leader. Really? And called there. And my dad told him where he could find me, and he called me at work, bro. That's amazing. And hit me up at work. I remember I'm standing in my boss's office on the phone with Ross, and he's like, here's the deal, kid. You know, like, we need somebody. It's going to happen in, like, four days, five days or something like that. Like, wow. the tour starts in, in six days or something. And if you want to do it, we're going to fly you out tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> kind of shit you know and i was like wow uh wow sounds really cool <laughs> you know like odious was not like what it was you sure. know, we weren't like didn't have shit planned out months ahead yeah <laughs> and then he was like you know you know we're gonna pay a cash every week you know and i was like you're gonna fucking pay me play fucking devil <laughs> wait i get to get paid for <laughs> you guys like i was like holy shit <laughs> he's like yeah but we gotta know like today and i was like I was like, all right, bro, let me call you back. I got to talk to my boss and I'll call you back. Because I had nothing else at the time. I didn't have like right. a girlfriend or any other thing sure. to keep me where I was I at. Know. Just this job. Yeah. And it was a new job. Went to my boss. My boss at the time, super fucking cool. Former musician. Well, current musician, but former gigging so musician. So he gets it. He was like, dude, you got to go, man. Yeah. And I was like, really? And he's like, dude, you got to go. I was like, he's it's like, like the Henry Rollins story. Totally. <laughs> and he's like, don't sweat it. You know, when you get back, we'll find something for you. You know, you'll have yeah. somewhere to work. And I was like, that's fucking awesome. Call Ross back. Let's do it. He was fucking shocked. He's like, dude, we called everybody. We called Tim Young. We called all these guys that were, right. that were filling in drummers at the time. Because I don't know if you remember, but- at that point in time, there was a lot of crazy death metal coming out, mostly due to California. California was raising the bar. There was a lot of bands out there with super fast drummers. Okay. Do you know Florida? Needs of Flesh, Severed Savior. This was after that. The okay. California wave happened a little bit after that. Okay. And they were swapping drummers. Drummers in short supply. And, you know, 
Like dudes were having a whole- Not a lot of people can do it. Dudes were having a whore around, right. And um, I was like, they're like, if you think you can do it, you know what I mean? And I'm like- your name? From Unique Leader. So he was in contact with them or were they was. signed? They them? ran out of options. They ran out of- straight out of options they had nobody left to call so they called unique leader because <laughs> they knew that the bands on that label had drummers that were throwing okay so eric from deeds of flesh was like i got this dude on the east coast he's not touring right now M- you know maybe give him a call yeah and so they're like oh who the fuck is this guy and they had no idea who odious was or any of that shit right. but Luckily, at the time, Jim Kanye's roommate, huh. Woody, was their tour manager. No way. And was like, oh, this guy, I've seen him play with Odious a million folks. Oh, yes. Yeah. So they got a double That's vouch. That's the Jim Kanye reference. Totally. It comes up every time. <laughs> so they got a double vouch for me. Yeah. So they called me. And plus, they didn't have any options left. And the fact that I had the balls to be like, I'll do it and I'll do it in four days. Yeah. They were like, holy, all right, kid. You know, did you, so, were dude, you familiar with all the music? Or? Not all of it. Yeah. Which was a bit of an oversight on my part because I was super familiar with the old shit. I used to practice it all the time. Like I yeah. practiced all my old favorites. And because I had that shit down and because I played in Odious and Odious was just fucking crazy drumming. I was like, Psh, sure. I got you, dude. We're, we'll, we'll do this. And I was really good. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I knew. Yeah. And had confidence in my ability to learn shit fast. I could yeah. learn songs right. fast. Yeah. So, yeah, dude, I went to fucking the mall <laughs> after work, and I bought the C. He gave me the set list right then and there while I was at work. Yeah. These are the songs you need to learn. So I went to the mall, bought the fucking CDs that I didn't have, Yeah. started listening to them all on my Walkman. <laughs> right. Kids. Yeah. That was a thing. All yeah. night. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't use your phone. You no. had a thing that you had to Yeah, that so. had to go with you. And then I went to the airport the next day, Yeah, got on the plane. Like, this whole time, dude, I was just pounding these songs over and over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember. It was like 20 tunes. <laughs> the whole flight over there. They picked me up at the airport. I meet them. We hit it off in the car. Fucking great nice. dudes. Funny as fuck. Italian guys. You know yeah. Yeah. We're, I was a little younger than them, but we're still the same age and shit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was just... I, oh, are I, they the same age? They're a little older than me. Okay. I, I thought they were old. Right? Yeah, they're rough. Yeah. We're roughly. They got a couple years. Yeah. But, yeah, and there was a whirlwind three days of practice in Ross's uh, mom's garage. Um, just playing to the CD. Yeah. Because those guys both had jobs. Then around six o'clock every day, well, every day, <laughs> the first two days, Bob would come home from work, come over, run through some songs with me, and that was it. Because on the third day, they called the cops. The neighbors called the cops. So then we had to rent a studio. So on the third day, I played like an hour and a half or whatever with Bob at this practice spot on some other kid. Yeah. And then the fourth day was the first day of the tour which was in New York. And the old drummer wanted to play that show. So he played that show, the first show. So I got to go watch him play with the band, the songs that I was supposed to play, <laughs> right. see him do it. And then the next day was the first day of the, the tour for me with them. And the first time that show was the first show I'd ever played with them as a band <laughs> on stage. How'd that go? It was a little weird, but it was good. Yeah. So, yeah. So this dude that I was replacing was su- all about going super fast. And he, because of the fact that they just practiced together all the time as a band, those songs got really fast. And he would play them hyper fast live. Now, you go back and look at videos. Doesn't everybody show that, though? This guy was a little extreme. And he yeah. was kind of weird, too. Like, he would slow some shit down and then go hyper fast with other shit. It was me. It just bad. I don't know that his meter was bad, but he was just like, he's very herky-jerky with keeping, uh, like, real quick. If a drummer plays stuff fast live, I'm guilty. It's a drummer. You play everything a little bit up. Every, Every riff, is, right. riff is a notch up. Right. So 
the overall dynamics between the riffs is going to be the same. They're just all kicked up a couple BPM or whatever right. happens to be the yeah, case. Yeah. This dude was weird. He would play the fast stuff like super fast, yeah. and then the slow shit. He would even slow down yeah. sometimes, yeah. and it was just it was weird. Yeah. So that I played that first show with them, and they were like, their reaction was like, it was like we were playing underwater, because I was playing the speed of the CDs, because I had only practiced to the CDs, man. So I'm playing these songs at their original tempos. <laughs> and they were like, whoa, whoa you know? Yeah. So they had to kind of chill to, to match me. Yeah, yeah. But right away after the first show, Woody, who was out on the road with us on that, was like, dude, sounds so much better. He's like, the groove is there. The songs sound like the songs. You right. know what I mean? It's just like, he's like, so much better. And so they adapted right away. Yeah. I mean, even by the end of that show, we were locked in. And uh, yeah, and they liked it better too. You know what I mean? So yeah, well, they got a pro. I wasn't though. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just like by compared by to name them alone, but ability you were. Yeah, right. sure. Name, you know, jobs. You know, yeah. Um. So, so, so that's there. It is. You're, yeah, you're in immolation. Well, no, I wasn't. Oh, this you're was not. just a fill-in thing. This was okay. a hired gun situation. Oh. Okay. So I ran around the country with them for a month. Did all these shows. I'd barely been out of the tri-state area, maybe to Florida on vacation before that. So now I'm seeing our entire country on tour, playing drums for Revelation every night, meeting all my heroes because yeah. those fucking guys know everybody. So when right. we went down to Florida, the guitar player was roommates with the guys from Cannibal Corpse. Oh, nice. Malevolent Creation was down there. We, our, a lot of stories from that tour, but our trailer or our vehicle broke down, so I had to borrow the opening band's drum kit, which only had one bass drum, so we had to go to Lee Harrison's house from <laughs> from uh, Monstrosity yeah. in the morning before the show and borrow a bass from, from him. Wow. Like, he was one of my fucking heroes, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Fucking Harrison loaned me a bass drum. Like, it was like that the whole tour, you know? Like, my mind was just blown. <laughs> It was like all those guys could awesome. do to keep me out of the pit every night. They're like, no, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. You can't be in the pit. But, you know, we had like Grave was opening up for us. So we're like, yeah. good night. Like, <laughs> they're like, and how old are you at the time? Uh, what is it? 33? 34. Young guys still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, early 30s. Yeah. Yeah. It was fucking awesome. It was wow. fucking awesome. But the deal was I was just going to do the tour and then dude was going to come back the reason i was filling in for dude was because he had some sort of complication medical complication from the touring that they were doing leading up to the point where they needed me they did a big long chain of tours and the dude had some sort of intestinal problems and herniated or something right it was affecting his drumming and he needed to get it taken care of but he didn't tell those guys about it till like two weeks before the next leg of the tour oh. that's why they were in the hot seat to get a drummer in a hurry okay and a story so he was supposed to come back. So I finished that tour. Dude, it was awesome. You guys are the best. Had such a fucking amazing time. I can't even tell you. You ever need me again? Let me know. I'm there, man. You know? See ya. Month later, they call me back. Hey, we want you to be the man. We want wow. you to be our new drummer. I was like, what? And they're like, yeah. And we want you to record the new album. We're supposed to go in <laughs> in October. <laughs> nice. So... At that point, I had come home from the tour and immediately went back to work with Odious because there was a, a very, very emotional thing there. Sure. When I said, sure, yo, baby. dude, I'm going on the road with M.O. Yeah. Scott was, was fucking, you know, there was, it was, there was a lot of hurt there. I was yeah. hurt. He was hurt. We we're both, you know, it was, it was tough. It's an but, opportunity um, though. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And I'm coming back. I'll be back in a month. We'll be right. right back to work. So we did. While I was gone, he started Stress Lord with some other friends of ours and right. and Adam. Yeah. So it was great. Yeah, that bit. So when I came back, Stress Lord was a thing. Yeah. Also, I forget how it happened, but we had come in contact with Fami, I think maybe MySpace. Okay. And those guys were like, yo, we need a drummer. Tony don't want to do it. You know, yeah. and I was like, okay, what's going on? Mechanicor. Yeah. It was like infested meeks Meshuga. Okay, so you that was that was all going on at the same time. Yeah, I just oh, came no home. Kidding. Yeah, I came home and that shit landed in my lap. Oh, okay. Also, at the same time, we met these dudes from Parma, Missing Skin, and they got Scott in to do vocals, and then their drummer flaked, and they were like, "Yo, Scott was like, yo, Steve will do it." And I always wanted to do like a crowbar type band, and that was exactly what they were. were like right. slow, heavy. 
So I was like, so now I'm doing Mechanicore and I'm doing Odious and I'm doing Missing Skin all in my bedroom. And then we had another drum set downstairs where Stress Lord would play. Oh, wow. So we would do sometimes four bands a night. So wait, you were in Stress Lord as well? No, no, no. Oh, okay. They would, that's why they played on a oh, different drum kit. Understood. So the one drum kit downstairs, one drum uh, in my oh, bedroom. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Mechanicor, Odious, and um, Missing Skin yeah. would play upstairs. Yeah. Stress Lord would play downstairs. And you're still, at the now time. you're the guy for Emulations. Not yet. Oh. This was in the interim. So I came home from that tour before they had called me back. So that a couple months went by and then they called me and said, we want you to do it. I see. And I'd already been playing with all these other bands shit at the time. Uh, right, so I was right, fucking right. primed. I was ready. I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Nice. Yeah. So you, you get the gig for immolation and then what? So how does, it, how does that change things? Like what? So how was the recording process going in there? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah? Uh, I maybe have never wanted to kill myself more. Why? Like, I was seriously, oh. Okay. So they're <laughs> like, we got to go. We're already scheduled for October. I mean, I don't even, what do we, we have material? No, we don't have material. We're going to come out to your place and going to write the stuff. So I was to like, okay. Your place? My place. Because I didn't like have- in Painesville? It, no, I was living in, <laughs> in Hamden. It was in Hamden at the time. Oh, okay. So I had been in Hamden for a while, and then we had moved down the street from where I was living with those guys when, when Gene left. Everything kind of blew up. And then I got my own place down the street a ways, and that's where this all these bands were practicing. Okay. So, uh, yeah, they were like, we need, we're going to be in Texas, so we're going to come out to you. You, got, you have a space. If I went to New York, we'd have to rent something. It's expensive. No, so they either. didn't have a spot. No, no, no. Then they knew you had a spot. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's I was like, come on up. <laughs> Them, they were both living in Yonkers. So were they you, were you shocked? No, oh, I mean it was cool. It was. Yeah. I, I mean, I was relieved. Obviously, it's an eight hour. Yeah, you didn't drive. have to go. It's so yeah, you know. But, but the, that's that's interesting that you're in a band that's doing so well, and then they they come to you. Oh, it's great. <laughs> it was cool. But it, it just meets and logistically. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so they would come out and we would practice. So they would come out, we'd start writing songs. You know, Bobby, like this is what I got. Okay, and we're doing it the old way. I write a drum part, or he's like, I got this in mind. You know what I mean? He's very drum oriented. He has a lot of drum ideas. Yeah. So it's it's cool the relationship I have with him as far as that goes, creating stuff. But that's what we did, and we would record the shit on a, a fucking boombox and a tape. You know, back really? then, that's what you did. Yeah. Well, what else are we going to do? We didn't have laptops. That shit wasn't even around, bro. And that, yeah. You know? And that switch, yeah. Yeah. We weren't even in like flip phone yet. Yeah. So they oh, would, right. yeah. yeah, right? So we'd make a copy <laughs> of the tape. He'd take a tape. I'd keep the tape. They'd go back to New York. Bob would be there with that tape until the next session, be it a week, be it two weeks or whatever. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's changing everything, you know, because he's the creative engine. Sure. So he's changing what he wants to do. So that by the time we get together the next weekend, everything's fucking changed. Now I'm working on the same songs again. Okay, so progress is slow. We're doing cassette tape pre-production, so the sound quality is not great. And before you know it, it's time to go in the studio. We don't even have everything yet, done yet. You know what I mean? He's still like working on songs and shit. And so we go in, never been in a real studio, never worked with a real real fucking engineer you know what i mean right like this dude worked with bad company and fucking crazy yeah, filth it. and anthrax and all this other shit yeah I'm like okay so uh this is in new york yeah this is in millbrook upstate new york okay paul orofino millbrook sound studios fantastic guy he's like fucking family to me now i've worked with him on every emulation album yeah um and he had done three or four before i joined the band oh god so we went up there and uh He's like, yeah, I'm going to set up the mics. You know, I set up the kit and he's like, I'm going to set up the mics, get the kit ready and shit. And you guys do whatever. I think I can't remember when we were grocery shopping or some shit, went out to lunch. We come back. He's fucked up my kit so bad. He took the front heads off, took all the pillows out, put all the shit in there, detuned the, the batter heads and shit. Like really? he doesn't know death metal. Like this dude, the only death metal he does is immolation. So he's used to rock and shit. He doesn't realize that you have just fucked my whole game up. I got to really? play super fast double bass that I've been practicing on on 
my kit in situation A and you have just turned into situation X yeah. and now I've got to try to perform it. So it was fucking super hard. Oh. Also, first time I played to a click. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. always hard for me. So when you listen to that album, you could hear me like kind of chasing yeah. the click here and there, you know what I mean? It's, I did my best, you know. They, you, no, even the best, I, I've noticed because I recorded a bunch of bands and mm -hmm. the first time they could be an amazing musician that never played to a click and it's, it, it takes, it, there's an adjustment. It's getting used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I forgot to mention. Yeah. This is very Steve Shalati. I fucking, I had a dirt bike accident months and months and months and months before yeah. I, like, I'd had this for a, a year or two, this, yeah. this wound in my leg or whatever. And right when I got back from that tour, it started to fuck with me. Yeah. So as I was recording the new Odious demo, I was like, it was starting to fuck up. And I'm like, what's wrong with my leg? It's not doing what I want and shit. You know what I mean? Setting me into a spiral of despair. I couldn't play the way I used to play. I was, you know, that was my fucking livelihood and shit. So I started seeing some fucking medical professionals try to get to the bottom of it, figure it out. It took forever. They put me into like physical therapy for months and stuff, trying to figure it out that way. Eventually I had to have surgery. Why? On my leg, my lower right. leg. They had to do a compartment release i had compartment syndrome because i had bashed my leg on the dirt bike and the scar tissue was creating a circulation problem between the compartments in my shin and calf muscles which yeah. you know, i was using for double base so i would sit down be okay but very soon like i would have the circulation issue in my right. my my muscles would start malfunction anyway so i had to have this surgery a month before i went in the studio <laughs> yeah dude Talking about behind the eight ball. Yeah. On top of that, Bob, the shit that Bob was writing for this album was not like the shit that he wrote for the last album. It was oh. way different. And you I think was it's like, because of your influence, maybe? Don't. Oh. No. Don't. You don't think that? No. I think he, those guys got a complex because they used to always write real weird, herky jerky, off time signature stuff. You know, it was right. very techy kind of in certain sure. ways, you know what I mean? Right. Which was great. Whatever. Gave them yeah. their unique sound, you know yeah. what I mean? It wasn't like prog in a, in a traditional prog sense. It was just different. Wasn't right. It? They would do shit that was not 4-4 on purpose and weird feels and, yeah. or, you know, and there was none of that on this album. Like, and they- Malevolent Creation kind of has stuff, you know, kind of sounds sure. odd. Kind of yeah, and in death metal, it's just a technique you use. You write it that way on purpose yeah. to give it a fucking left turn because people listen to death metal because they don't want to hear pop music that's the same speed for right. a whole fucking three minutes. You know, what I mean? they right. want to hear shit change dynamics. Right. You know, uh, and he had like abandoned that, and it was very straightforward and driving, almost like a morbid angel militant, very yeah. militant feel. So you know, I did my best, but uh, you know, I didn't have time to write the shit and. And and uh, so I was going in there, and a lot of the stuff I was playing was just like off the cuff, and whatever I played was what and, you know drum fills and stuff. I yeah. didn't I didn't have the time to write out each individual fill. Yeah, oh, it was tough. I was under a lot of pressure, man. It was fucking weird. You know, so it sounds time. like you weren't a big fan of that first recording of what of Harnessing Room. I'm not. No, I can't stand that. Yeah, it seems that's yeah. the picture you're painting right now. <laughs> yeah, when I finished that. <laughs> I was driving home from New York and I was listening to it that he gave me the raw drum tracks to yeah. the drums and I was fucking so disgusted I threw it out the window You're I was like I wanted to kill myself yeah. I wanted to kill myself because <laughs> now there's no going back those are going to be the drum tracks whatever they do over the top of that is whatever it is those drum tracks are going to be those drum tracks and when this fucking album comes out all the emulation fans are going to listen to it. Oh, here's the new drummer, and they're going to fucking hate it right. because the style is different, the drums are different, the drums are not as like I didn't think they were as as cool, as interesting, and as like precisely written and artistically played as previous drummers had done. Right. I I felt that I had completely and wholly failed to fill my obligation and. As a Always fan, your own worst critic. As a fan and a member, oh, I'm really bad with that. Now, at this point, moved into the era of, like I mentioned, like MySpace. Um, there were these online forums, uh, like DerekRoddy.com, which is a drummer forum. Okay, it was like taken off. It was huge. 
social media was beginning and it's beginning myspace right. Um, there's you, a, you mentioned MySpace. That's like yeah. the first. Kind of, well, yep. GeoCities, I think, or something. Yeah, like, yeah, I wasn't involved there. But yeah. but yeah, these things were going on in these online forums where people yeah. from everywhere could get together and throw their two cents. Right. All you know, these critics were born, you know what I mean? So like- You can't listen to them, dude. Dude, it was brutal <laughs> for me because with Odious, everything was cool. I, I wasn't ever exposed to that- you know, widespread criticism, you know what I mean? Or where it's just like, I want to listen. I'm, I, dude, I read the, the comments on these things, man, and talk about, oh, it's awful. Oh, man. If you want to get a low self esteem, just read the comments. Oh, it's, it's, it's an ego bruising thing. Yeah. So, yeah, people, there was people that were really brutal on me and it was tough. And, you know, I, a lot of my peers in the drumming world, like that I had met on that first tour and that, yeah. you know, I mean, just for, through the forums and stuff kind of helped me and propped me up came to my rescue actually in a lot of occasions where like yo dude give the fucking guy a break you know what i mean yeah i think you did a great job you know what i mean i'm always be thankful for that those guys know who they are but um that was a tough thing to get through them well the first were some of the things they would say it's just to like, take you back down there and <laughs> where the fuck is alex that's that was the thing oh, where's alex yeah you know fuck this guy where's alex we want alex back that could be the shit change oh dude yeah and Dude, I knew. See, that's the thing. Like, I knew Alex is fucking powerhouse. That drummer yeah. is fucking animal. And I'm trying to fill his shoes and the drummer before him, who is fucking legendary too, Craig Smolowski. Yeah. And I'm trying to fill those shoes and, and right. play on par with them. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just very different stylistically than Alex, the guy right before me. So yeah. it, was, it was a departure. And I knew that going in. I knew that I'm driving home from the studio. You know, yeah. that's why I want to just fucking. Mm. Cause I was, I knew that shit was coming down the road, you know? So, okay. So that happens, whatever. Right? But overall, that album was very well received. Okay. Very well. And for Immolation as a whole, it was a step up, like from, from what they had done before me. So now they were so, like doing better. So it's almost like better. Metallica's Black album. Everyone, the true fans hated it, but then it was... <laughs> it wasn't even that bad. It wasn't yeah. even that bad. You know what I'm saying? It was just because I was involved and I had right. I personally sensitive to what was... Well, you did say that they, was said. You did say that he was writing differently, too. He did, but it was yeah. well-received by yeah. the majority of their fans, by all the mainstream right. uh, media, like yep. magazines and stuff like that. Everybody reviewed that album, liked the album, nice. gave me good props. So there That's was awesome. plenty of good stuff out there, too. So, okay. So obviously you recorded other albums with them too. Like, so did you feel like the next album you came into your own and kind of. No, I want to kill myself. <laughs> I had more time with this one a little bit, yeah. but it was still a total rush job. Really? Yeah. Yeah. But at least I was able to correct a few things like play to the click. Yeah. You know, now right. I know that I would need to rehearse to the That's clinic. an easy, that, that's an easy fix. I mean, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh. Pre-production was still on a boombox. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I was still like figuring out my fills when I was in the studio. And yeah. this time we did like 13 songs because we were doing the full length album and we're also doing a European issue only EP that was uh, a bunch more songs, you know, like a handful more songs. And we did yeah. the whole recording session at the same time. So it was a lot of songs for me to do in one session. It was brutal. Got it done. Still wasn't very happy with it, you know. Going home, I was still like, oh, young. So, what album? Very unsatisfied. Hopefully, there's an album that you can say, "All right, I'm proud of this one." It was. It's a gradual process. Yeah. As as we refined how we did things, pre-production, and all that, uh, and as we adapted to that, it got better and better and better. And the the key thing is. Give yourself some time. Before I joined that band, if I was going to do an album, it was a project. It was something that was months and months and months in the work. It was hundreds of hours of rehearsal with the guys, Absolutely. getting everything worked out, tempos and all that shit. With these guys, totally different. Well, they, they always say that. Like, with the first album, you have your whole life to make it. The second album, you have, like, a year or two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I had never been in a situation where, yeah. like, the album, the the label wants an album by so-and-so date or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So um, 
And Bob's just not the kind of guitar player where you're like, yeah, we need songs. And he'd, okay, I'm getting right now, you know? Yeah. It's got to be time for him. It's a, a more of a, a organic, like a natural thing for him. It's got to happen when it happens. And So after that first album you, you recorded, um, and it got well received, the touring for that, like that must have been an adjustment for you because you're not really used to touring. Like, no, right? but I had done that tour with them previous so okay. i mean that was my introduction to touring and it was great and we didn't do a whole lot as i recall for harnessing ruin the yeah. first that was the first album that i did with them um but yeah that was cool and i enjoyed that much more because now i'm playing the stuff live and i have the liberty the artistic license yeah to do things a little differently to make me happy and more satisfied with the effect that is nice. created with the music. So, in other words, I could play stuff a little faster if I thought it was cooler that way. Right. I could change a fill or two here or there slightly to make it different from the other fills. That was one thing that bothered me about the first album. The first two albums was that I was like, man, I'm just playing the same fucking fill over and over. It seemed like <laughs> I was getting a lot, very repetitive. Yeah. The Death Metal song is a million drum fills, if for me especially. Yeah. So by the end of the album, you end up recycling a lot of stuff, and that's I was never really happy about that. But live, you get to do whatever you want, you know, right? At sure. least I did. And it wasn't something where the guys were like, "Hey, I noticed you're playing this a little different." It was, ne <laughs> it was never doing doing anything like that. Like I pervert, preserved the songs, but I was able to play them my way. And playing live is where it's at for me. That's just more fun. That's where I have my fun. Playing to a click is fucking dead. You know that's that's ex so you don't play to a click live. Okay, so yeah, Not yet <laughs> <laughs> seems to be the revolution, right? Yeah. Um, no, well, yeah. I I've always thought like playing to a click is just a uh, it's like a practice recording thing, and then it's, when you go, it's got its use. Yeah, yeah, it's got its use for, yeah, sure. for sure. I use a ton of. I play. I spend a lot of hours playing to metronome. So, have you made a recording with Immolation that you were like? Fuck yeah. This yeah, man. I got it. I After that second one, yeah. I'm driving home completely forlorn. Uh, for the third one, um, we got signed to a different label for that one. And I went to the guys, and we, we had done a lot of touring for that second one, first time in Europe. You know, we had, had played a lot together at that point. Right. And I was like, I remember going to them I forget when it was. Maybe it was on the t one of the tours before when we knew this was the last tour they for the that second album. And I was like, "Listen, we got time. We got a new label. We got the lineup that can play whatever the fuck you can imagine, Bob. We're the guys. We can do it. I can do whatever you want me to do on drums. Bill can do it. Ross can do it. There is no reason." that we can't sit down and just make the best fucking Immolation album yeah. that's ever been made. We're in a position right now to do that. Let's fucking do it. Right. You know what I mean? Let's take the time. Let's make sure everything's right before we go in, you know? Right. And we really did carry that attitude through that whole project. And that was the first one where I was like, all right, cool. But immediately when he started bringing me music for it, I was like, this is going to be a fucking humdinger. This is more like it. And to me, that was more like the old immolation you know okay I mean? for me it was a, more of a return to form so and and i had the time to work on that so new label new producer or no nope same guy same same guy okay so and then um same process same everything it's just you had fucking more... boom box again <laughs> last one for that though last one yeah yeah and the mistake there was um and i still have these cassette tapes which is sick but we the guys would come out, we'd play through the songs, all the songs on the album, record it on the boombox, listen back to it, and we based all our click tracks off of that recording. So we okay, we took the speeds, we're like, oh, okay, we're going about here, we That's how you with the metronome, ba -dum, ba -dum, and we based it off of that. However, it was a very spirited practice. Obviously, playing live with a band is an ad adrenaline thing. Sure. And it was on a boombox. So oh, there's yeah. a lot of fast stuff on there Yeah, that sounded good. But once you're in, in the studio under the microscope and you got to play those double bass patterns super tight, tight, you know, not like 
cassette quality sound. <laughs> right. You know, like studio. Yeah. Was a little difficult. And I had, I had, uh, you know, we overdid it a little with some of the temples and stuff, but I managed, uh, you know, I managed. You got it. To You're a pro. Sl slam it in there, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> But that you know that was an important lesson to take away from that. But after that album was it, we started with the um, to do pre-production on computers, laptops, GarageBand, send files back and forth. Yeah, that was it. That was it for rehearsals. <laughs> we didn't rehearse anymore. No, it it definitely with uh, technology, it made it a lot easier mm -hmm. to to get shit done. Yeah, I mean, even with the pandemic, you know, people were just like sitting in their house playing live things, just. Everyone's in a different yeah. state. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so after that, that became like, we became the band that never rehearsed. Oh, is that right? So we would have a tour. Like, dude, we would write the album distance, never rehearse. Yeah. I would meet them in New York. I would record the album. Still had never played with those guys, any of these songs. Right. The album would come out. We would get the first tour. I would meet them for the tour, and the first night of the tour would be the first time that I would play the songs from the new album with those guys. How'd that go? I've done that a lot. Yeah. They, they fucking... The left. first time, though, what was that? They latched like? onto that shit. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. It was, for me, it had been that way since the beginning because I would practice for tours anyway. I would practice to the recordings, yeah. just like that first one. You know, I'm practicing the recording. It's going to sound like the recording. The speeds are going to be the recording speeds. Yeah. Yeah. And if we're all practicing to it and doing our homework, which everybody was good at and right. and still is, then when we get together, it's that that kind of thing is possible, which is a complete 180 from what I used to do, where right. it was all organic, all rehearsal, five, six times a week. You know what I mean? But that was the only way to do it back then, though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's still different any way you look at yeah, it. Yeah, you know I mean? it is. Well, and it's... It, it's I mean, you do it because you want to be in the room with the guys playing. You know, it's a... I miss it all the time. Yeah. I pine for that. And yeah. when we do, I've been able to talk them into it, you know, a few times. When we do get together, it's so much fucking fun, dude. It's yeah. much better. For sure. Well, that's why you do it. I love that. And that's why you love the live thing, because you're actually playing with them. It's a different You thing. know? Yeah. It's a different thing. Well, you know, I, you know, I've always said playing with the band. You know, I obviously... You know, when you're really synced in, you know, it's, um, it's a, I don't know, cathartic experience. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a meditation. Oh, dude. It's a, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's tapping into something. It's nearly indescribable, dude. Yeah. It's been yeah. there for me for a long, long, long time. Yeah. And that's the difference between me playing to a click and. <laughs> right having Scott Bryan in the room throwing riffs and videos yeah. and shit and then like all of a sudden I'm playing fast and, and just you know yeah. it's a high it's it's definitely a fucking it's there's nothing like it that's what I'm still doing yeah. you know I mean it's just it's fucking crazy is there gonna be an odious uh, reunion I was just playing it last night Scotty yeah, yeah. Scotty sent me clicks and guitar for a couple tunes <laughs> and uh, yeah I'm gonna re-record some some of the old stuff and then oh. we're working on new shit too. Really? Scott's a busy, busy, busy man, dude. He's I know. He's bands. got. I saw him posting stuff about Stress Lord. Yeah, he's a riff factory. He's got mm -hmm. Stress Lord, and he's got like a couple other bands that are just him. You know, Mercury Lakes, one of them. ZW um, three seven 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 is the other one. He's just crazy shit. Life Crusher. He's, you know. So when am I gonna see Odia Sanction play in Cleveland? <sighs> I don't know. That's been the hard <laughs> part, dude. Like we've been asked to do it a bunch of times and we've been motivated to do it a, a bunch of times, but it's just like, who are you going to get? You got to get, uh, you got to get, um, uh, Aaron Dallison's bands. You got to get what well, either Keel Hall or, uh, no, not <laughs> that. Oh, I'm just saying to play with them. Right. Uh, like yeah, yeah. who the fuck are we going to get to play? Like yeah. guitar. So yeah. come on, there's gotta be some young kids nowadays that are, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> but how do you find that kid and convince him to do Well, hey, do anybody that wants doing. to play elite level death metal, man. dude, get up. Gene was uh, an anomaly. And so for that reason, we kind of kind of screwed ourselves a bit because he was like, he was crazy. Yeah. And in his band that he was in before us, they played really low tuning 
on super heavy gauge strings that yeah. were like fucking bass strings. Right. And, but still like down pick. It was still very fast yeah. stuff. And so when he joined our band, his chops were just unmatchable. Yeah. And so he could just down pick like a machine. And so all the riffs were based on that. I mean, there's a lot of that in Odious. You know? Yeah. I mean, it had groove, but it was all a lot of down picking and shit. And uh, it's just hard to find a, a guitar player that could play like that. It really is. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, yeah. It's I furious. Can't... And it's a lot of work. So yeah. anybody. I play guitar could, and I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even think about asking. <laughs> anybody that could, even if you found somebody that could do it, you have to convince them to do it all the time right. so that yeah. can, yeah. you know what I mean? And then practice, it's just, it's just tough. Yeah, it's it's tough, man. It's Scott's, lot. Scott's close, you know, he just, he doesn't like the idea of fucking giving himself carpal tunnel <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so, um, oh, but, you know, Scott just wants to sing or. No, 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 no. He just doesn't want to play those fucking chainsaw uh, machine gun yeah, riffs. Yeah. You know what I mean? All the time. So, yeah. so the stuff that we're doing is has that element, but it's got other elements too. And uh, you know, it's all heavy. as long as it's heavy and pissed yeah. and full throttle. That's all I care about. You know? What Are I mean? you gonna be record anything? Yeah. yeah, I'm trying right now. You like I said, that's, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna record some drum tracks to this stuff. We're taking our time and just okay messing around. We've written a bunch of new stuff. But, um, again, we feel that, uh, so maybe like an EP or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We feel like we have to outdo ourselves. There's no other way to, to do it. You know what I'm saying? Well, the you know, way you said put out something that's just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's still them. You know, it's yeah, just like, right. no, this has got to be. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're working on the songs and, and he's, dude, he's got tons of material, tons of energy. He's still pissed as fuck. Okay. He still does the same vocals, man. It's, just, <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. So, it, it, uh, yeah, I think that's a good place to leave it here. I think yeah, yeah. I have something else to say, man. I don't, I don't know. No, man. Um, <laughs> just, uh, just keeping on, keeping on, man. Like, yeah, yeah I'm just still keep... doing the immolation stuff. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we'll hear some. What it's going to be? Odious sanction, or is it, it will be a difference? Movie. Yeah. I may be involved with different projects with him. Like I've done yeah. stuff with him already in in the interim that were different, different. Okay. But because the the music is the same, yeah. it's going to be odious. I may do other things with him too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just because we love playing with each other, we vibe off each other. It's you know, it's just a good good relationship. But, yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we hang out all the time. Talking about same old <laughs> shit, man. So. That's awesome, man. Well, dude, Steve, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, man. Steve. Love that. It's a great yeah. hanging out. It's a good excuse to hang out with somebody. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. It's cool, man. I love it. I really do. Awesome, man. Well, dude, thank you again, yeah, man. Have my a, pleasure, man. Yeah, it was a great old days. Have great success. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> you too.